Back when I was in high school, I started to work at this bakery. I needed some money and I didn't know where else to work, so I went down to this bakery called Weber's Bakery. And I met the guy who owned the bakery. Had little skinny legs, little tiny feet, big fat belly. Looked like a barbecue grill. His name was Weber. And, and so I went up to Weber and I said, can I work here at the bakery? He said, well, what can you do? I said, what do you mean, what can I do? I said, what can you do? I don't know how to cook much, but what can you do? All right, all right, look, look. I don't know, I, don't, I can play basketball. I can spin a basketball on my finger for about five minutes without letting it fall off. All right, you're hired. <laughs> and the next day when I came, I found out why. It's because when people came to Weber's Bakery, they didn't just come to buy stuff that was baked. They came to watch it being made. There were a couple of guys that played for the high school football team. And one of them would take the dough and he'd throw it, hey, go for the bomb! He'd throw it across the bakery, he'd go, spider webs get into it, the other guy catch it, get sweat and armpit hair and stuff on it, he'd just pack it together, stick it in the oven. Yeah. People would be like, cool, they'd pay money, they'd stick money on it. I'm like, man, that's weird. So I finally thought, well, what can I do? I picked up some dough, stuck it on my finger, started spinning it like this, dough was flying all over the bakery, but finally it spun a little hole and I thought, donut. <laughs> I can do 18 donuts a minute. People started putting money down. Weber said, all right, I'll give you a raise. Three cents. <coughs> Gee, thanks very much. <laughs> I went home that night, and I watched this old Clint Eastwood West. <coughs> Next day when I came back, I had an idea. So we baked the bread in these long ovens, eight foot long. The bread, you'd have to cut every two feet so that you'd have four loaves of bread that were two feet long. And usually you use a knife, but I went in the back room and I got these butcher knives, these big old like meat cleaver things. And I made these little holsters out of cardboard. I put one in and I pulled it out. I said, my dough. <laughs> Whoever came up, all right, I'll give you a raise. Here's four cents. Oh, gee, thanks. I went home that night, and that night I watched this old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called Terminator. Yeah. Yeah. Next day when I came back, I bought these black little glasses, had these little red lights lit up in the middle there, and I was no longer Stephen James, mild-mannered storyteller. I was now the chef in me. I could cut those loads over, boom, 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 boom. just like that. Here's a raise, five cents, gee, thanks. Next night, I went home. I watched this show called Inspector Gadget. I came back next day. I took this, old, uh, this other meat cleaver, and I stuck it next to the ones. I made these little extending arms for the two that I had, so that when I attached it and pressed the release button on the top, they would jump out two feet to the side. And then I press it again, they jump back like that. I put it in my holster. I could cut four loaves of bread at a time. I called it my four loaf cleaver. <laughs> that was the day, that was the day that I met Professor Lestian. He taught at the local university. And Professor Lestian came in and said, you look like the kind of guy who likes to have fun once in a while. I said, yeah, once in a while. He said, how would you like to go cave exploring with me? My old caving partner isn't around anymore. I said, where is he? He's not around anymore. Oh. Well, let me read a little about caving. So I went home and all week long I read about cave exploring. I found out that there's these things hanging from the ceilings in the caves. What are they called? Stalactites. what? Stalactites. Yeah, tights hanging from the ceiling. And stalagmites, the ones that look like you dropped an ice cream cone on the ground, stick it up from the ground. What are those called? Like mics, you're right. Yes, uh -huh. you have to be careful where you sit in the cave. Ow. <laughs> and I read that in a cave you're supposed to bring a uh, change of clothes because your clothes get muddy when you're in a cave and you gotta change clothes before you get in the car. Bring two water bottles in a cave. Now, you bring two water bottles. One you fill with water and you take it in the case you get thirsty in the cave. The second water bottle is, is for uh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, when, you, when you go into a cave, you can't leave anything behind in a cave. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. It's like, if you're in a cave and you're thirsty and it's dark, you better be careful which water bottle you grab. <laughs> and then you're supposed to 
bring two separate and distinct forms of light in case one flashlight goes out. Well, all that sounded good, and so I went back to Weber's Bakery, and that was the chef in there. <laughs> Four little cleaver. And then came Professor Lester. He said, well, here's a list of what you need. He gave me a list. I said, well, okay, I know one pair of clothes. That's easy. Two water bottles. Believe me, I'm bringing two water bottles. Fill one with water. I'll be careful when I'm thirsty. And the third thing listed, though, he said, you have to bring three separate and distinct forms of light. And I said, Professor Lester, let me ask you a question. Why three lights? All of the books that I read in Caving this week said you need two lights. And he said, well, it's in case they come. I said, in case who comes? <laughs> he said, in case the hot eggs come. I said, Professor Lester, I, I know all about hot eggs. I live up here in the north in Wisconsin, the north woods. I said, I know all the stories the lumberjacks told about these hot eggs, these creatures that would live in caves. They would come out, grab you, drag you into the cave, jam your body between rocks, wait for you to die, climb inside your body cavity, and eat you from the inside out. <laughs> I said, I know all about these. I know they're just legends. And he looked to his left and right, and then he pulled up his shirt sleeve, and on his forearm, there were four scars embedded into his skin. And he said, it's a good thing most people think they're legends. It looked like somebody run over his arm with a garden weasel or something. <laughs> he said, they need five minutes of total darkness to sniff you out. Bring three lights into the cave. I said, brother, I'm bringing an extension cord with me into the cave. <laughs> he said, now three lights should be plenty. And and so then he left and he said, I'll see you tomorrow morning. I'll pick you up and we'll go to the cave. I said, all right, great, Professor Lester. And that day, though, before I left Weber's Bakery, I stuck something into my backpack just in case I might need it. I brought home my four loaf cleaver. <laughs> the next morning, Professor Lester drove over. He picked me up and we drove into western Wisconsin to a place called Boscobel Bear Cave near Boscobel, Wisconsin. And we got permission from the man who owned the land. We went up into the hills. It was about this time of year. It was a beautiful autumn day. And there was this little hole in the ground. I said, well, there's the rabbit hole, but where's the cave? He said, that's the cave. I said, that's not a cave. I'm never going to fit in that. That's not a cave. It's just like it's big enough for my big toe. He said, we're going to go in. It's the cave. You'll fit. Now what? He said, there's a couple things you got to know. First of all, you go into a cave, always keep your arms out in front of you. You never get them stuck to the side. If you get them stuck to the side, you can't pull yourself forward or backward. I said, okay, that's good advice. What's the second thing? He said, the second thing is, if you ever get in a real narrow spot, you might have to exhale all of your air to make your chest smaller, then pull yourself forward, and typically then you can inhale again. I said, well, what happens if you can't inhale again? <laughs> he said, well, then you die in the cave, hold eggs, sniff out your rotting corpse, climb inside your body cavity, and eat you from the inside out. <laughs> I said, people do this for fun? What happened to your old partner? He's not around anymore. Yeah, I got that far. <laughs> and before I could say another word, <laughs> Professor Lestian disappeared into the hole, and I followed after. The first room wasn't that big, but there was some stalactites tights hanging down and mites on the ground. Careful where you sit in the can. Had our little helmets and little headlamps on. And Professor Lestian was wearing a light blue nylon jacket that was very uh, lightweight material, but he could slip through, it was kind of slippery, so he could slip through tight passages. And I followed him through a passage that was narrow like this, and he, he, it was almost filled with water. I thought, man, I hope it doesn't rain down here, it's gonna fill up, we won't get out. We had to crawl on our stomachs for a while, exhale our air, pull ourselves forward. Thankfully, I could inhale again. Now, finally, we came to the end of the cave, a little room, and Professor Lestian had mapped out the cave up to this room. And he said, all right, now off to the left, there's a little passage I'm going to go down. I'm going to map it out. I want you to stay in this room. Are you good to stay here for a while? I said, yeah, 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 no problem, no problem. That's good. All right, I'll see you in a little while. All right. And then he disappeared off to the left, down a narrow passage, heading down. And for a few minutes, I sat there. I was looking around the little room, the little room in the cave. And I'm kind of like, well, there's a rock. There's some dirt. <laughs> There's another rock. More dirt. <laughs> There's a rock. More dirt. <laughs> Mud. <laughs> <laughs> kind of got bored, you know, sitting in this little cave. 
little dirt and rocks is all there was. There wasn't anything else to see. And finally I said, all right, I remember back to when I was reading about caving. And all the books on caving suggested that when you're in a cave, turn off your light to see what it's like to be in complete and total darkness. So I reached up to my headlamp, turned the light to the off position, and, and it was dark, totally dark. It was so dark that you could not see the chin on your face. Everybody in here, when I said that, went like this. Huh? You can't see the chin on my face? It's right here. All right, let me go and after a few moments, I heard the sound coming from where Professor Leshen had disappeared. It sounded a little bit like someone dragging a metal claw against stone, or fingernails against a chalk. Oh. And I have to admit, I kind of freaked out a little bit. I jumped back, oh, and I bumped my head against one of those stalactites pits hanging from the ceiling there. I smacked it so hard, I heard the glass shatter from my headlamp, and I could feel something warm oozing down the side of my face. I tried to dial it on, of course it wouldn't work, it was broken. I peeled off that headlamp, reached into my bag, pulled out the other one, put it on, dialed it on felt up here and I could feel it was blood coming down my face from where I'd hit the stalactite and the glass had shattered. And then I looked over to where Professor Leston had disappeared and I saw four long narrow claws reaching up, curling over the edge of the passageway. And then another four until the face pulled into view. It was about the same size as a bulldog's face, but razor sharp teeth, slits for eyes, and as it stared out at me, drool kind of hanging out of its mouth. In a little pool of drool forming there in the cave. Hodeg drool. And hanging out of its mouth was a torn piece of light blue nylon fabric. And I freaked out. I was so scared. I was so scared that I completely overlooked two things. Number one, that I needed to use that second water bottle. <laughs> And the second thing I overlooked was the fact that I had the four loaf cleaver there in my bag and the creature came forward, it pulled itself into the passage, it reached out its claws, it grabbed my foot, no, no, <laughs> Steve, Steve, no, no, Steve, Steve, huh, huh, huh. I looked up, Professor Leston was shaking my foot. What? I said, Steve, are you all right? You, you hit your head, you knocked yourself out, are you okay? I said, oh, Professor Leston. I had this terrible dream. I dreamt you were a whole day. He said, well, I'm not a whole day. Look, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Maybe we'd better head, head out of the cave. He's like, what's that smell? Never mind, Professor, never mind. I could use that change of clothes now, though. I was kind of embarrassed, you know, there I was, bonked my head, flashlight busted, and the whole thing with the second water bottle and everything. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm crawling after Professor Leston, following him out of the cave, when suddenly I bump into him, he'd stopped, his light had gone out. I said, well, what's wrong? He said, I don't know, my light just went out. What are you on? I said, number two. He said, let's hurry. A little while later, a little further, both of our lights went off at the same time. I said, Professor Leston, what's going on? He said, I don't know, let's get out of this cave. And just then I noticed something. I said, Professor Leston, where is your blue coat? Oh. Oh man, when I was at the bottom of that passageway, I took it off, I laid it on a rock. I forgot it down there. Hey, I gotta go back and get it. It's my favorite caving cloak. I said, wait a minute, Professor Leston. We are not alone in this cave. He said, I know, I've been smelling this horrible smell. I said, it's not the smell. <laughs> Just then his eyes got really big. He was staring past me. I turned and I looked, and there, coming our way, was the hoed egg, and it wasn't afraid of the light. Professor Leston, all of a sudden, ah! he took off. I mean, he, he was gone. Are you okay in the front there? No. I mean, he took off into the kit. I suddenly, I'm looking at the hoed egg, and I see a little passage between me and the hoed egg. I see Professor Leston's had pop out. He got freaked out. He got disoriented. And he came backwards in the cave. He looked at me. He looked at the hoedeg. Looked at me. Looked at the hoedeg. Looked at me. Looked at the hoedeg. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I remembered something. I realized in that moment that I had that cleaver in my bag. And I realized that I had been overlooking a four-loaf cleaver that 
I'd overlooked before. I ripped open the bag, I pulled out the cleaver, I said, Professor Leston, watch out! I threw it through the cage. Four perfectly sliced pieces of hode! Why, they're wriggling in their own blood in the cage. And crawling past Professor Lester and I grabbed the bag to go get the pieces of hoe day. One of his eyebrows was laying in the cave too. I got a little closer. Sorry about that. As, as I passed him, I said, Professor Lester, what's that smell? He said, never mind, Steve, never mind. I went past him, I grabbed those four pieces of old eggs, stuck them into my bag, and then I led Professor Leston out of the cave that day. And I've been caving many times since, and every time that I go caving, I always remember to bring along one change of clothes, two water bottles, three separate and distinct forms of light, and I always remember, just in case, to bring along my four loaf cleaver. Yeah!